This is Mandatory Listening. I'm your host, Kent Mann. Each week, we sit down over a cup of coffee and discuss interesting topics in the world of the customer experience. Welcome back to Mandatory Listening. This is Ken Mann, and I'm joined again by Leslie Cunningham. Hello. And we are on a roll with a few of these podcasts we've had. We are. Not really sure on the uh, order of which they'll come out, but uh, we've had a few good topics here. Yeah. And I'm wrapped up in a blanket because it's freezing, and I think it's because of the concrete floors that I'm barefoot on right now. Yeah. But it's a cold dungeon where we record these podcasts. Since our listeners can't see this... Just so we know, Kent does have shoes, but they're next to him. So he's choosing not to wear his shoes and be bundled up in a blanket. I mean, I'm kind of a, you know, no shoe kind of kind of person. Yes. They are Chacos. So yes. it's not it's not like it would be. <laughs> no, but like you would have a buffer. <laughs> yeah. So I'm complaining for no reason. Yeah, it, well, it's fun to complain. I just want the sympathy of everyone okay. listening. Well, yeah. I don't know that I have so much for you today. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So I wanted to ask before we get started here on our topic, if you could go to one country, where would you go right now? Not saying like, you know, you just have to leave right now. If I had to leave right now, I would go to Italy. Hmm. What part? Don't know. Why? The part that has lots of really good pasta and wine. Okay. That part. So you're going for the pasta and the wine, I'm guessing. I mean, yes, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Craving pasta since I am doing the lovely keto process. Oh, once again? Uh Uh-huh, once again. That'll be fun. It's so fun. It's quite a struggle uh, to get started. Especially the intermittent fasting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not going to lie. So you've never been to Italy? No. Okay. Mm -mm. What part of Europe have you been to? I have been to Portugal. Okay. Mm -hmm. What for? I went on a three-week missions trip with my church in high school. Hmm. And what was it like? It was amazing. Hmm. It was really eye-opening. So, Portuguese is obviously very similar to Spanish just by, you know, location. Since you know a little bit of Spanish, how is it, how did it sound different? Portuguese, the language, and for any of you who speak it, I'm sorry to say this, but it's a really not pretty language to hear. Is it a romantic language it's, like Spain and French? It is a Spanish and French. I it's German and Spanish hmm. and I believe a little bit of French mixed together now. So it's a little harder. Yeah, don't quote me on that. The only terminology that I learned from the missions trip was cala boca, mm-hmm. which means shut your mouth. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. <laughs> Directed at you? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. But the countryside, the landscape, the beaches, the tile were just very impressionable to me. And I would go back in a heartbeat. Awesome. Well, today is uh, Hank's birthday. Hank Mann. Yeah, Hank Mann's birthday. And last summer when we went to Canada, Montreal Mm -hmm. and uh, Quebec, we noticed that the French there is vastly different than, of course, European French. It's like a mix of English and French because they, you know, romantic languages normally flow and mm-hmm. they're kind of musical. That one was just, you know, Quebec French is just very hard. They end each word and it's kind of abrupt in that sense. Mm, so interesting. it almost sounds like a Southern accent, but speaking French. Oh, uh, yeah. And that was a, a, kind of a culture shock to me. <laughs> but let's get into this topic here. Do you want to introduce it? I'm um, sure. So yeah. uh, we talked last week a lot about a lot. And so (laughs) I wanted to dive into a little bit more specific on how we approach our world differently. And Mm -hmm. so we talked a lot about how we all have our own thumbprint. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, we have our own way of communicating. And there is no right or wrong in the way that we approach our communication. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit more specifically today and talk about just our approach in how we view tasks and projects Mm -hmm. because there is opposite ends of the spectrum as it relates to just our approach in doing tasks and projects. So what are the two ends of the spectrum, if you could define them like that? So the higher end of the spectrum is someone who has a big sense of urgency. Hmm. So 
I'm moving at a really fast pace and I'm very short fused and very direct Mm -hmm. in my approach to tasks and projects. And then the opposite end of that is someone who is short fused and very modest as it relates to projects and tasks. So is this also wrapped into the effectiveness of the task? Like, if I have a high sense of urgency, does that also mean that I don't like to get it done right? Like, is the opposite, like, are we going by accuracy of the tasks as well? Or is it strictly by the time frame attached to it? I think it's... Because it's kind of a multivaried problem. It is, and it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. Again, if I think more than anything, it's the approach that I'm taking to the task. I'm not necessarily measuring whether the task is done in detail or not. Mm -hmm. Because you could be someone who is very focused on detail, but still have that urgency. Yeah, because if you're hiring based on a, you know, a unit dimension or, you know, a a single dimension of work efficiency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. So let's say this job needs high urgency, but then completely miss the accuracy of the task itself. You've kind of set yourself up for disaster. Right. You know, you've kind of gotten what you wanted, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. but you kind of missed a whole different side of it, of the efficiency and the maybe even collaboration. Like I need to get this done. So screw everyone else. And I'm just going to get it done myself. And you miss an entire piece. So it's like almost like a spectrum of, you know, how many pieces are there to one task? Right. To, to, I think also to one task, but also to one job description, because I think that there are multiple competencies Mm -hmm. as it relates to jobs. And so if we're not able to define exactly what we need as far as competencies are concerned, then it's going to be a harder job in finding that person because we're just finding a person for the sake of finding them. Okay. Rather than focused on, give me an example of how you approach tasks Mm -hmm. and can they show you urgency if that's what you're looking for, or can they show you a a systematic approach if that's what you're looking for? So does this fall into the criteria under creating the job? Like we said in the last podcast where we're crafting a job for a specific and then looking for the person. Correct. Or is it, this person is on, you know, has this level of urgency, therefore they're not suited to the job. Which way are you starting? So probably both Mm -hmm. because we have people in positions now who we might need a little bit more urgency from, but we hired a person who that's not how they approach their tasks and neither one is right or wrong. But once we know that information, we know how to coach. And then knowing that, Oh, yeah. In this manager's job, I do need someone who's going to be urgent. Then hiring to that becomes into play as well. And asking the right questions to know that they've given you good, solid examples of how they are urgent, how that plays out and what that looks like in their Mm. their day-to-day. So, let's say you already have a team of people. How do you start by evaluating all right, these people's level of urgency or their level of buy-in to this work, this way of working, you know, whether this one is a arbitrary, I'm just, this is for a hypothetical, a medium level of urgency, a high level of urgency, or a low level of urgency. How do you def- start to define that? What's step one? Well, a lot of this is you can tell by behavior. Uh So we use the DISC assessment Mm -hmm. um, at the man group to to learn this information. But you can also pay attention to just body language as it relates to even walking. Mm -hmm. If a person is naturally urgent, they're going to walk very fast and in a straight line. And they're not really going to slow down for you if you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. So that would be a sign. Now, this is general characteristics. Right. And there it's until you've taken the assessment, it's a little bit harder to um, nail down. But one way of knowing if you're an urgent person and someone isn't moving fast enough for you, they're probably on the opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. And that's the the yin and yang Mm -hmm. of complication as it relates to communication because someone who is very urgent naturally and is working with someone who is not urgent, then our judgment begins. Mm -hmm. Well, 
they're just lazy is sometimes right. a thought process that happens. Right. They're, they don't get it. They don't get it and or they're not <clears throat> bought in. Yeah. Well, maybe they are, but they're bought in at their pace mm-hmm. of handling or their approach of tasks and projects. Mm. And so we have to be able to come to a place of acceptance of both based on how we have hired. Right. And then begin to look at a new way of hiring people so that we're actually fitting the mold rather than trying to force a mold. Right. So and get frustrated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so the first question that came up when you when you mentioned the walking example and that question is that what if that person is very urgent when it comes to that task and the example is walking like let's say they like to walk fast or they maybe have long legs or mm-hmm. you know they just move their legs fast and they have long legs and so it just causes them to walk faster than the average person but then on other things they have no urgency so can we relate them walking fast to them being an urgent person that is a great question because there is also an approach to our pace yeah so an approach to tasks So maybe walking wasn't the best example Mm -hmm. because we're really focused on the task and the projects component of that. If someone is looking at their pace, so there's a spectrum on how I approach my pace. Mm -hmm. One end of the spectrum is very passive, kind of a patient person, non-emotional as it relates to pace. The other opposite is very emotional and eager as it relates to pace. So, those people who pace a lot are going to be on the opposite end of the people who are more apt to being non-emotional, very systematic flow, like a, a rhythm almost, if you will, as it relates to pace. Yeah. So, I guess what the example I was trying to come up with, with the walking one, is <laughs> that... So from a personal example, last year when I was trying to go to, or when we were planning the trip to Montreal or uh, Quebec, I started learning French Mm -hmm. just to be, you know, I can understand the street signs and understand what road I'm at and understand, okay, what is this person saying to me? Or can I say, do you speak English? You know, whatever. And I had grown up in a, basically, you know, my mom is fluent in French. And Mm -hmm. so I grew up around it. We had foreign exchange students in the house. And so... You know, I was exposed to French, Mm -hmm. but it never stuck. It never stuck. I never became conversational. It just seems to come and go. And right now in my life, I have a multitude of people that speak fluent Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I've begun learning Spanish or trying to learn Spanish. And I think I can see in myself a different approach to learning those two things. The task being learning French versus learning Spanish. Mm -hmm. And... With Spanish, I'm not only, like with French, it was just I was learning on Duolingo and like learning some French, you know, YouTube videos basically to learn some common words. With Spanish, it's I'm listening to Spanish podcasts. I'm listening to Spanish music. I'm listening to other people speak Spanish. I'm telling people speak, you know, what does this mean? I'm reaching out and I'm also doing Duolingo. And then I went through a whole, you know, 20 episode lesson in Spanish. And so my urgency to Spanish is way higher than my urgency to French. But if you had just taken my urgency at French, you would have said, oh, this person's not urgent. Do you see what I'm saying? So which task do you decide that this person Mm -hmm. is this way? Mm -hmm. Or do you have to take it task by task to say this person is really urgent when they're managing people and this person is extremely not urgent when it comes to sales? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I do think that part of this is a component of also motivators, yeah. which we will get into in, in later podcast. Yeah. Part of this is you are pretty motivated as it relates to tasks and projects that have influence over you. Mm-hmm. So your drive to learn French, your obsession to learn French, your obsession to learn Spanish are still the same mm-hmm. where French 
served you for a time period. Right. Spanish is going to serve you for a lifetime based on the friends that are in your circle now. Yeah. And so that then becomes a motivator, but your determination, your drive, your even sometimes frustration when you're not getting it fast enough yep. shows that you are in that high spectrum of the driver. Hmm. You're going to take things and run with when they serve you well. Hmm. Same is true with the podcast. You know how to get it all produced. And that was self-taught. That was your drive. You're managing it. And you're determined to see it to the end. So I guess if you if each person were to take a disc assessment or some sort of motivator or personality test like that, you would have to look at the motivators if you're managing them. You would have to look at their motivators and then play that job to that specific person's motivators unless you wanted to move them around. It's critical to know what motivates your staff. Yeah. It's critical to know the cadence for what the way people want to receive and give information. Right. So that's the first component of the assessment. Yeah. The second component of the assessment is what wakes them up mm. in the morning, what's yeah. motivating to them. Because if you're underutilizing someone in a job, they're going to leave, get bored. It, it can sometimes be a health hazard, but not always. Right. But you're not using them to their potential. They're not growing as a person. Correct. Yeah. And and so uncovering what motivates people is is equally as important as to understand what pace they set. The pace for projects and tasks creates a lot of frustration because if, if you think of the word pioneering, what do you think of? I think of uh, a guy carrying a musket and a map <laughs> and, you know, maybe has a raccoon on his head, like that kind of hat. Perfect. Yeah. That's exactly what I, I was envisioning that you would say. Yeah. So let's James think Town. of another word like strong will. <laughs> I mean, I was just being honest. I know. I appreciate that. Yeah. So someone who is determined, somewhat aggressive, uh -huh at their approach to tasks or projects or whatever they're getting into their job, if you will, versus someone who's very calculated and cooperative, mm. maybe even somewhat hesitant. Yeah, Those are opposite words, but we're still doing the same job. And if we create frustration before we create connectivity, yeah. we're going to have issues with the people that we work with. Yeah. And so that's what we are trying to communicate with these assessments is first, let's break down the judgment that we have if someone's yeah. not moving fast enough yeah. or on the opposite end of the spectrum, if someone's moving too fast, we usually have words to describe people like them. Um, Leslie, I don't think anyone moves fast <laughs> enough for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. Um, Kent man. So that is, if we're at a place where we're judging people's performance based on how it makes us feel, then we're not able to connect and really have rich relationships as it relates to work and really be effective towards the goal of our company. Hmm. So how do we, I mean, I'm thinking of people who have, they have to manage 20, 30 people. Yeah. And they have to sort through, you know, okay, so I have to talk to this person about this and they're this kind of communication style. So I have to act like this. And then I have to, you know, five minutes later, I have to talk to this person who is this kind of communication style or is motivated by this. This seems so complicated. And I mean, I'm sure, I mean, this is your like baby almost. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, does someone become good at this when they're not certified in these types of, you know, personality examinations? I think awareness is key. Just to understand, <clears throat> I'll never know it all, but I can at least try. I can at least try to understand that people have different approaches to life. Yeah. So whether it's an approach to their tasks, whether it's an approach to people and or rules and regulations, everybody yeah. has an approach that's different. And so if we can understand that that is potentially the case for the rub. Yeah. So if someone rubs you the wrong way. Yep. I would more than 100% say it starts with the way that we're communicating with each other. So 
I mean, this is such a big topic because yes. we could go into every single one of these segments. And, you know, I, I think if we could just have, I mean, when you're teaching the DISC assessment, you break it down into the quadrants of the brain. Correct. And so we can just kind of lump these, you know, okay, well, these tend to, these people tend to fall into this category most of the time. Mm -hmm. And then other times they tend to fall into this category some of the time. At what point does this become counterintuitive where I'm spending too much time yeah. just trying to not hurt anybody's feelings Yeah, because we still have to get shit done. You know, right. we st we're still a company. So, yeah. you know, at what point do you draw the line? When you're not getting the results mm. that you hired a person to get. Yeah. So that goes back to last week where creating the job first. Correct. So that way there's no misinterpretation of this job did not get done. Right. And to, I think it's important to know that there there's no right or wrong decisions, but being clear on the choices that you need to make for the positions that you're hiring are critical. So for example, I'm working with a client now who needs people in their company who are working autonomously. Mm -hmm. So what does the word autonomous look like from a job description standpoint? Yeah. And then how do you go and find, once you've defined that, how do you go and find those people? So what are the questions that you're going to ask to draw out examples of how they are autonomous? I think this also goes to, you know, outside of hiring, the people that you already have, yes. you know, if you want to start something like this, where you want to start communicating better to your team, would this be like a yearly or six month or even monthly like review? How did you feel, you know, your skills aligned with the job description? Do you mm -hmm. feel like you need an updated job description? You want to move away from this role into that role? Is that a monthly thing? Is that a six month thing? Or should, you know, is it like, okay, expectation wasn't met instantly calling a meeting? I think if I'm, hearing the question right, I believe we're always coaching. Mm. As it relates to our behaviors and tendencies, you're going to know every day whether it's a fit right. because of the rub that you're having. Yeah, And the more natural it seems, then you've done a really good job in hiring. Yeah. Now, there are, like we talked about last week, there are skill sets clearly that people will always need to gain. But the basics of how we approach our tasks, how we approach people, needs to be understand or understood in the job. Because if you need someone who's a people person and you've hired a pessimist, mm. you're going to have a rub. Yep. You're going to have issue. And it's not, it's not a bad, it's not right or wrong. And I want to be clear on that. It's just, it's going to take in more energy for that person who's a pessimist to turn on that switch and be optimistic yep. when people come through your door. Yeah. Especially if you have a standard for this is the way our store or this office environment has to be this is my standard because it's my company or mm -hmm. because it's, you know, I'm the boss. Right. This is my standard. And so therefore it's not right or wrong, but you know, we've got a miss, you know, there's a missed expectation here. That's right. And so, you know, I think that to reiterate the, it's not right or wrong. Just, is this the right job for you? Right. Is this a right fit? Is this a win-win? That's a, that's the importance of the win-win conversation when you're having interviews Yeah, is this has to be a good fit. I mean, even like I said, six month or yearly reviews, mm -hmm. is this a win-win still? Mm -hmm. Is this still a win-win? Is this where you want to be in a year? That's right. Is this where you want to be in five years? That's right. And so being, I think oftentimes people are scared to have that conversation mm -hmm. because it's like, well, what if they leave? Well, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what if they leave? Because it's, if you would you rather them stay and be miserable? And you be miserable. And you be frustrated mm -hmm. because, you know, they're on their way out. They don't want to be there anymore. And, right. you know, or the other end, someone really wants to stay and you want them out. Right. And they're just begging you to stay. Right. That's also horrible. Yeah. So yeah. bad situation on both ends. But I think the more often you're communicating mm -hmm. about, you know, communication, communicating about communication, um, <laughs> but just having that open dialogue of like, okay, we're, we're never going to be in a place where we're going to ignore this tension that we're feeling. Yeah. And sometimes that tension is okay. Sometimes you need a yin to your yang because yeah. we definitely don't want to have all Kent Mans what? in the man group. What? I know. Are you it's kidding? It's sad, buddy. But Well, 
<laughs> we'll leave it to the listeners we definitely, to decide. We definitely don't want a lot of Leslie Cunningham. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and so the ability, again, to have all types of people in your company to progress your vision forward is takes a collaborative effort of very vulnerable communication without judgment that we've been conditioned to believe that we already have. And so if we can let go of the fact that, Kent, you just don't move fast enough for me, Mm -hmm. rather than seek to understand who you are and your approach, because I might learn something. It, It seems like a very basic understanding of communication. However, I see it so often where the frustration has risen to over a hundred percent where this person is a terrible person. I don't even know why we're hired them. And that just can't be the case. Yeah. Especially in, you know, today where firing people is, can be such an issue sometimes. Yeah. You can't get angry and fire people anymore. It's not acceptable anymore. And so giving someone the power over you to make you angry just has to be, you know, moving forward. It's a challenge, a challenge to the listeners, a challenge to myself, a challenge to everyone to don't give someone the power over you to let them anger you. Yeah. And it's a constant every every minute struggle. Yes. But just that, that struggle against that negative emotion, I think is always a good thing Yeah, because you're just, like you said, awareness for it. It takes a great leader to understand that when you are already evoked yeah. into a negative feeling about a person, yeah. they've done nothing. It is your own story that you need to listen to. Yeah, yeah. So, I, well, I think that's a, as good a place as any to yeah. to cut this one. I think we've really, you know, just cracked the door on this subject yes. because it's so huge. And yeah. I would love to hear, this is the end of the podcast club for this one. I would really love to hear your feedback on this. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Always up for different interpretations. Everyone's got a different perspective on this and communication styles. And we've really hit hiring hard the last few podcasts, but I think it is so important, not outside of hiring, but also how do you evaluate your team? Yep. How do you evaluate yourself? And uh, and I would I would love to hear people's opinion about if you have a yeah but situation that you would like to email us or call me directly or email me directly so that I can look at the situation because I think that that will help us in this process of understanding about how to be effective communicating. Yeah, I I found in my life having a different perspective just for someone to listen and to provide their perspective Mm -hmm. can be absolutely, you know, world opening Mm -hmm. in some sense. It just, I never thought about it that way or just the fact that you telling it, getting off your chest and getting that almost like toxic Mm -hmm. feeling outside and just letting it sit for a second Mm -hmm. has been hugely beneficial for me. And not letting those negative emotions weigh you down. Yeah, um, good. And just being able to, having those people that you can share with at all times yep. um, is is hugely important. So yeah, that's the end of the podcast club. Feel free to reach out. Love to hear your feedback on that because it's something that we are, are constantly evaluating. Yeah. So um, thanks awesome. for listening and thanks, Leslie, for joining. You're welcome. That's it for this episode. If you like what you hear, subscribe and leave a review on our iTunes channel. We'll see you next week. 